Yeah, so in the last class, uh, we have learned about uh, digital radiography and now that we have covered uh, digital radiography also, we have almost covered all the aspects of uh, radiographic uh, testing now. And uh, the one important aspect uh, which I am going to talk about uh, today right now is that whenever you do uh, radiographic testing which uh, involves these radiations, the radiation safety is very, very important. Okay? So, this is one thing that one should always keep in mind while uh, working with radiations like what you have in case of uh, radiographic testing. Okay? So, this radiation safety that is what uh, will be the topic for our discussion today. And uh, if you talk about uh, safety with regard to radiation, uh, there are two things. One is called uh, the engineering uh, safety controls and the other one is called administrative control. Okay? So, this all is to ensure that uh, the personnel and the examiners who are working with the radiation for doing radiographic testing, uh, they are not exposed to harmful radiations. Okay? And at the same time, uh, people around this uh, radiation zone uh, are also not exposed uh, to uh, this radiations. Okay? So, all these things are uh, done in order to uh, protect people uh, from the harmful radiations. Okay? So, if you uh, talk about this engineering control uh, for the safety, you have this under this uh, engineered control, shielding, uh, door interlocks, alarms, warning, lights, rope and signal uh, around the portable radiography which is done on the site. So, uh, you might have seen this kind of uh, signals, this kind of signs in and around areas uh, where there is radiation. Okay? So, this must be there uh, around uh, the lab uh, where this x-ray radiation or x-ray uh, radiography is done because then people would know that around that zone uh, there is a chance of exposure to, to radiation. So, this is the first thing uh, that you should do in order to let everybody know that around that particular zone uh, there is x-ray machine and there are radiations around it. Okay? So, that is just to uh, indicate the area where you have the radiations, but uh, you cannot let the radiations go out even if you indicate that around these areas there are x-ray radiations and things like that. You cannot let the radiation go out just like that. Okay? So, that means when you do this uh, X-ray radiation exposures for uh, capturing these radiographic images, you need to do it under a shielded condition. Okay? And for that, you need to have uh, the exposure vaults or exposure cabinets. Okay? So, you need to keep the X-ray machine first of all uh, inside a room uh, which is uh, well protected against radiation. So, you should have thick walls, thick concrete walls. So, that is the first thing. In many of the cases where the radiations uh, or the X-ray intensity is higher, you also may have to use uh, lead seats on along the walls of that particular exposure room, so that nothing comes out uh, from the uh, exposure room and uh, around that area there is uh, very low level of uh, radiation which is not really harmful. And as far as possible, this radiation going out of the room uh, should be uh, kept close to 0. Okay? So, that is uh, about uh, the exposure room. Then uh, when you have the machine, uh, in the machine also you should not uh, keep the sample openly. So, that machine also should have an exposure chamber which is again shielded. Okay? And lead is one material, if you remember I told about uh, this before also that uh, Lead is a material which is very useful uh, for uh, shielding against X-rays because it can easily capture and absorb X-rays. Okay? So, the exposure chamber that you have in the machine, uh, it has to be made out of lead seats or similar kind of materials which can easily absorb X-rays. So, that from the machine itself uh, you start the shielding process. Okay? And whatever comes out from this shielding chamber, from this exposure chamber, that you control through the walls uh, of the exposure room. Okay? So, outside the exposure room, uh, as I said, you should ensure that the radiation level is really very, very low, close to 0. And when you do the exposure, uh, it is also uh, advisable that you let others know that uh, 
the radiation is on. So, you should have some kind of alarms or indicating lights. You might have seen this uh, in an x-ray lab that can be right outside the door there is uh, some uh, red color light and whenever the x-ray machine is on that light should also be on. Okay. So, that is how people would know that uh, right now the x-ray exposure is being done and it is better not to go around that area. Okay. So, that is about alarms and warning which uh, comes under this engineered control with regard to safety against uh, x-ray radiation. And if you are doing it on the site where you have open exposed areas, then around that exposure area, since now you do not have four walls and enclosed room, you should use uh, ropes around it, you know, first of all to uh, prevent people going around that area. And you also should uh, provide uh, enough signals and uh, indications, signs things like that around that area. So, that uh, people know that that area is being exposed to extra radiation and they should not go around that area. Then you have administrative control. This is uh, with uh, regard to protecting uh, the people who are working with radiation. So, you should have uh, postings and procedure and you should train the people who are dealing with uh, extra radiation. And you should also do time to time dosimetry. Dosimetry means uh, you should uh, examine the people who are working with radiation and examine the radiation level inside their body okay, in some intervals time to time. So, that uh, you know that they are not really exposed uh, and nothing harmful is happening uh, due to the fact that they are working with extra radiation. Okay. So, dosimetry is again uh, important with regard to uh, protecting people who are working with radiation. And it also has to involve training so that uh, people who are going to work on this kind of systems and who will be uh, dealing with radiation, they should also be trained and they should uh, be made aware that what could be the effects of radiations uh, if they are exposed to it directly without any protection. Okay. So, these are the different things uh, which must be done uh, with regard to safety against radiation whenever you are working with X-ray radiation or any other form of high intensity radiation. Okay. So, I said that uh, lead is a material uh, which is very useful for uh, radiation shielding. Okay. If you have a thin uh, sheet of lead metal, you can use that uh, to make a shielding chamber. Uh, around the exposure area or around the x-ray tube that you have in the machine. Okay. But in order to ensure that uh, the most of the radiation is uh, absorbed by the x-ray plate, you need to provide a particular thickness. Okay. So, in order to know that what should be that thickness which will uh, completely uh, absorb the x-ray intensity, uh, you need to uh, know about a parameter which is called uh, half value layer. So, the shielding is nothing but absorbing. So, it has to do with the absorption coefficient uh, mu and this half value layer as the name suggests, this is a thickness at which the x-ray intensity decreases by half. and that is why the name okay, half value layer. Okay. And this is uh, a parameter which is uh, much easy to remember because this is just a depth or a thickness instead of uh, remembering this mu. Okay. And that is why with regard to shielding, uh, this is the parameter uh, which is used for designing this uh, shielding chamber and uh, shielding vaults and things like that. Okay. So, if you uh, go back to this, uh, you can easily uh, find out uh, how the half value layer is uh, related to the absorption coefficient mu. So, we can go back to this equation that we started with. Okay. 
So, in this case what we are saying that uh, this is the thickness x uh, at which the intensity uh, would decrease by half. Okay. So, this x is the half value layer in this case. which we will call as H B L. So, for H V L the reduction in intensity is 50 percent. So, this uh, I by I naught is 0 0.5 when this x is equal to H V L. or you can write in this form also. Okay, which will give you H V L equals to L n 2 by mu and this gives you uh, H V L equals to 0 0.693 which is the value of uh, L n 2 by mu. So, this is the parameter uh, which can be used for uh, designing uh, shielding vaults and shielding chambers. So, this will give you the thickness which is needed uh, to completely shield the X-ray radiation. Let us take an example and then see how lead or any other material uh, can be uh, designed uh, to, to make a shielding chamber based upon uh, this half value layer. Okay. For lead mu is known and from this relationship uh, you can find out H V L for any given material. Okay. So, let us say I uh, have X-ray energy of the 300 uh, kilo volt and I want to shield this uh, x-ray of uh, this kind of intensities by using lead sheets. Okay. So, here I need to decide what should be uh, the thickness of lead sheet uh, which can reduce the intensity let us say by uh, 1000 times. Okay. So, that means, uh, what we are saying is uh, this will be uh, reduced by 1000 times. Okay. So, I by I naught will be 0 0.001. So, this is like uh, almost absorbing and shielding the X-ray radiation. So, we need to find out uh, for a reduction of uh, this uh, extent what should be the thickness of the lead sheet. And all I know is uh, the HVL for lead because as I said for this kind of uh, designing with regard to shielding this is the parameter which is used. For lead it is uh, point, uh, 1 6 inches. Okay, so, that means, I know that uh, 0 0.693 by mu of lead is uh, 0 0.16. Okay. So, I can uh, from here I can easily get uh, the mu
and then I can use this uh, in this equation again. So, we are looking for this thickness x which will make this uh, 0 0.001. and mu is this which we simply got uh, from the HVL. And from here we can uh, easily derive x and if you calculate x from this uh, you will get a value of about uh, 1.6 inches. Okay. So, you can see with just only 1.6 inches of lead you can reduce the x-ray intensities uh, by 1000 times. Okay. So, that is why as I said before also lead is one material which is very useful against uh, uh, x-ray or which is useful for uh, shielding against x-rays. Okay. And uh, other uh, material which is used for uh, shielding uh, is concrete because you can build uh, thick concrete walls or even the exposure chamber also in the x-ray machine can be built of uh, concrete walls. So, for concrete uh, the HVL is one point two inches. And if you do the similar calculation like what we did just now, then uh, you will see that uh, the thickness for which uh, this uh, reduces by 1000 times this x will be around uh, 12 inches Okay, so, for lead you need only 1.6 inch, but uh, for the same uh, shielding if you want to use concrete then the thickness of the concrete wall should be at least 12 inches which will reduce the x-ray intensity by 1000 times. Okay. So, this is how based upon this uh, HVL uh, the thickness can be calculated for a given material for shielding purpose. And at this point I should also tell you that. Uh, HVL would uh, depend on the X-ray energy because mu is uh, dependent on X-ray energy. So, for uh, the value that uh, we had derived uh, previously that is uh, the HVL that we had for lead that was uh, 0 0.16. this is uh, for this x-ray energy 300 kV because uh, this is uh, calculated based upon mu at 300 kV. And uh, with this we come to the end of uh, radiographic uh, testing. This uh, method we started a couple of weeks back. And now that uh, today we have finished it, uh, it will be good to take a moment to summarize and then see what we have learned on this particular technique. So, first we saw the basic principle of this particular technique and then we learned that it is based upon absorption of x-rays which can be defined by that uh, particular equation. And then we also saw that uh, the absorption happens uh, due to atomic scattering events. And we also learned about uh, different 
types of atomic scattering like photoelectric, Compton pair production, Rayleigh scattering and photo disintegration. Okay. And we have also talked about the relative contributions of each of these scattering events to radiographic method. And after that uh, we learn about the formation of the image in which we talked about first uh, about the photographic film and then saw how it is made, what is the constituent of the film and after that we discussed about the characteristics of the film. And we also learned about what is called as a film characteristic curve from which you could derive this film parameters like gradient, latitude and film speed. And from the characteristic curve we also learned that there are two types of uh, curves or two types of films. One is J-shaped in which you have one, two and three type of fill and the other one is S-shaped in which you have type 4 film. And then we talked about intensifying screens which are used for enhancing the quality of the image and also to filter out uh, the scattered radiation. And in that we saw that there are two types of intensifying screens, metal screens and fluorescent salt screens. After that we talked about the image quality and image quality indicators. With regard to the image quality, uh, we have seen that uh, the quality of the image depends both on the film as well as on the X-ray source. So, there are some parameters from the film which will control or affect the quality of the image and there is some parameter uh, from the X-ray source which will also affect the quality of the image. And with regard to the X-ray source, we learned about a concept called unsharpness which uh, primarily comes due to the finite size of the focal spot of the X-ray source. And in image quality indicators, we learned about uh, two types of uh, indicators. So one is uh, hole type and the other one was wire type. And after that, uh, we talked about uh, the film holder or the cassette which is used for uh, loading the film into the X-ray machine. And then we talked about the exposure charts uh, which are used uh, to decide the exposure time and we saw that the exposure charts are derived based upon these two laws, the inverse square law and the reciprocity law. And then we talked about the equivalent thickness also because uh, most of the time this kind of exposure charts are derived for a particular material like steel. And if you want to use that chart for other materials, then you have to convert the thickness into an equivalent thickness of that particular material using which the exposure chart was derived. Then we talked about the contrast uh, from an inclusion and a blow hole as an example to show you as to how the contrast uh, can be decided based upon the parameters which are used to capture the image. And then we talked about uh, this particular technique, uh, digital radiography. And in this we learned that uh, it is primarily based upon this kind of detectors which are known as uh, flat panel detectors which can convert X-ray intensity into an electrical signal which is finally converted into a digital signal to form the digital image. And we also learned about uh, this technique called uh, computed tomography or commonly known as uh, CT scan which is again uh, based upon digital radiography. So, we talked about that also and finally, we talked about radiation shielding because that is also important whenever you are dealing with the radiation and things like that shielding and protection is also important. So, we talked about uh, radiation shielding as well in which uh, we, we discussed different ways by which uh, you can do uh, radiation shielding and what are the methods and procedures uh, applied for uh, shielding against radiation. Okay, so, uh, this will uh, bring us to the end of uh, 
this particular chapter also. And by now, we have uh, covered all the NDT methods, all the commonly used NDT methods. So, we started with uh, dye penetrant testing and then we have come all the way to this radiographic technique. Okay. So, we have seen uh, the basic principle behind each of these techniques and then we have seen how each of these methods are done. Okay. So, you have a wide range of NDT techniques uh, to choose from uh, when you are doing NDT. Okay. So, the question here is uh, how do you uh, go about uh, selecting a particular NDT method uh, when you are doing NDT. Okay. So, this uh, question at uh, an NDT inspector has to face at some point or the other. So, is there any guideline which can help us in choosing a particular NDT method? Okay. So, let us see if you have uh, that kind of guideline uh, which you can use and decide uh, a method uh, for doing NDT on a given component. So, the first thing that you should know uh, when you are trying to select uh, a particular NDT method uh, for a given part that you have, there are two aspects of it. One is with regard to the defect itself and the other is uh, with uh, regard to the capability of the NDT method that you have in mind okay, or you have available with you. You remember we had talked about uh, the broad classifications of uh, NDT where I said that uh, this can be broadly classified into surface NDT method and bulk NDT method. So, this was primarily based upon the location of the defects. Okay. So, if the defects are located on the surface, then you have to go for a surface NDT method. Similarly, if you think the defects are located below the surface into the bulk of the material, then you have to go for a bulk NDT method. Okay. So, that is the first thing that you should know. Uh, you should have some idea beforehand as to whether the defects are going to be limited on the surface or uh, they will be below the surface uh, within the bulk. Okay. So, based upon that uh, information, you could uh, select NDT method either a surface NDT method or a bulk NDT method or a method which can do both. Okay. So, that is the first thing that you should know. You should have some idea as to uh, what you are looking for, whether you are looking to inspect the surface or you are looking to inspect the bulk. Okay. And then you see uh, with uh, regard to that uh, surface method or bulk method, what are the techniques that you have at your disposal that you can use. Okay. And whatever technique you have, then you see their capabilities, whether uh, they will be able to do that what you are looking for. Okay. Let us say you know that your uh, defects are going to be located on the surface primarily. So, you look for uh, surface entity methods and you have two or three of them. Okay. So, then you see for each of them what is their capability in terms of the sensitivity to detection. So, if you remember we have talked about this uh, for some of the NDT methods as to how the sensitivity is for a particular NDT technique. Okay. So, that you see, you see the capability of the technique uh, that you have in mind or you have at your disposal and select it. Okay. So, as I said there are two components of it when you are uh, when you, when you uh, talk about uh, selecting a particular NDT method, one component is about the location of the defect and the second one is about the capability of the method uh, that you want to use. Okay. So, all this can be combined uh, into a table like this which will uh, guide you. Okay, so, this uh, table will give you an idea as to how to uh, go about uh, selecting a particular NDT method. So, as I mentioned before, you have to first see uh, what is the type of defect you have, okay, whether it is a surface defect or whether it is a uh, volume or bulk defect. Uh, you also should see uh, what is the uh, nature of the defect apart from the location that means whether it is a linear defect or any uh, volumetric defect and things like that. So, both are important in terms of their detectability. And here uh, on this uh, columns, you could see all the NDT methods are mentioned uh, and on these rows, you can see some numbers are there. Okay. 
So, these numbers indicate uh, the suitability of a particular method uh, for a given type of defect. Okay? For example, uh, if it is 3, it means it is the best uh, possible method that you have. So, 3 means it is best suited and if it is 0, then that means that for that particular kind of defect, uh, this uh, particular technique uh, cannot be used. Okay? So, 3 means uh, best suited and 0 means not at all recommended. And then you have something in between like 1 and 2 also you have. 1 means uh, it is not so good and 2 means it is kind of ok to use. Okay, so, let us uh, have a look uh, what kind of defects you have and some examples as to which particular NDT method will be uh, best uh, suited for that. So, if you have a, a surface breaking uh, linear defect, let us say you, ha you have a crack at the surface which is linear. Okay. So, for that kind of surface defect, uh, you could see that visual method uh, is not so good because the crack may not be big enough. Uh, to appear to the naked eye or even with the help of uh, some kind of visual optical aids. And uh, the surface NDT methods that uh, we discussed like liquid penetrant testing, magnetic particle testing and eddy current testing. Okay. So, these are the three surface methods that we have discussed and you could see since it is a surface uh, flaw, all these three methods are good for uh, inspecting this kind of uh, surface defects. Okay? So, that is why a number uh, 3 is given for all these uh, three methods. If it is a surface breaking uh, volumetric defect, that means it is located at the surface, but it is uh, not linear, it is uh, volumetric, then you could see all the methods uh, can be used whatever we have discussed all of the methods can be used for those kind of uh, bulk defect which is uh, right at the surface. Okay. So, for that kind of uh, defect we do not really have any confusion as to which entity method to select any of the methods which is available at your disposal you can use that including the visual optical. And then you have uh, defects like near surface linear, but normal to the surface like this kind of defect. Okay. So, here again it is a uh, surface defect, but uh, it is a near surface or subsurface. So, you remember I said that uh, magnetic particle testing uh, is one of the methods which is good for this kind of uh, subsurface defect. So, a number 2 is given for that. So, it is good and the best for this kind of defect is eddy current. Okay. Ultrasonic uh, is not really good for this because this is very close to the surface and uh, you, ha you might have uh, that uh, dead zone effect, but angle beam can be used. So, for that uh, it is given a grade of 2. Okay and other methods are not really good for uh, this kind of surface defects. On the other hand, if you have a near surface linear and parallel to the surface, uh, that kind of defect if you have, then uh, the best possible uh, method would be uh, this uh, ultrasonic testing, provided you have uh, selected the frequency uh, properly and you have taken care about the uh, near surface dead zone effects. Then near surface uh, volumetric defects if you have, then the best possible would be any of this ultrasonics, eddy current or x-ray radiography. Okay. On the other hand, if you have uh, subsurface linear and normal to surface then uh, ultrasonic 
is a good method to use, others cannot be used. If you have uh, a similar defect, but uh, parallel to the surface, uh, there again uh, ultrasonic method is the best one. And for volumetric uh, kind of defects, which are below the surface, then you could see that none of the surface NDT methods can be used, only the volumetric methods like ultrasonics and X-ray radiography can be used. Okay. So, the selection of uh, these techniques, this is uh, depending on uh, the type of defects and this is how uh, based on this particular uh, table that you have you can uh, get some guidelines as to how to uh, go about uh, selecting a particular NDT method for a given type of defect. Okay. So, this will be uh, again as I said will be based on the type of defect and the capability of a particular technique uh, for the detection of that type of defect. Okay, so, uh, now we have uh, covered all the commonly used NDT methods and just now we saw as to uh, how to go about uh, selecting a particular method. Okay. So, this means that we are approaching the closure of this particular course, but this course uh, will not be complete without acknowledging the help and support that I have received uh, from various people for creating this particular content. First of all, uh, I would like to uh, put on record my appreciation for this NPTEL program, which has provided a wonderful platform for sharing knowledge. And in that regard, I would like to thank the NPTEL coordinators, uh, Professor Pratav Faridas and Professor Andrew for spearheading the NPTEL uh, program at IIT Madras. And I must thank uh, the director IIT Madras and the administration of IIT Madras for providing all the infrastructural facilities for uh, creating this video content. The entire NPTEL team is working uh, relentlessly uh, behind the screen for creating all these video content that we have under this NPTEL program. And it goes without saying that uh, creation of this particular course would not have been possible without their help and support. I have received a tremendous amount of support from the entire team and I am so very grateful uh, to all of them. I would like to thank uh, as well the NPTEL uh, camera crew team who were particularly instrumental in creating the videos. And at this point in time, I want to specially thank here uh, one person, uh, Mr. Ravichandran, uh, who was there with me from beginning to end for creating this video content. Okay. And last but not the least, I would like to thank all of you who have connected through this forum in any manner. Without your uh, participation, it can never be complete. And with that note, uh, it is time for me to say goodbye. I hope uh, this content will help you uh, in your respective careers. If you have any uh, queries with regard to this particular course, uh, please do get back to us and I do look forward to uh, receiving your feedback as well. And with that, it is time for me to sign off. Thank you one and all. Goodbye and take care.